test on April 24th, 25% of you said, I'm good, and 62% said that, that you were stressed, but it was manageable. And you can see how those numbers have shifted to the right over just uh, even a couple of weeks from 25% um, going down to 18% for I'm good, and, um, and then the, the stressed folks moving over to the I'm pretty stressed and it's starting to take a toll with almost a quarter of you responding last week that, um, that this was starting to take a toll. Uh, so, you know, we, we know uh, we're, we're all feeling that and, um, and everyone has their um, own way that, that this is impacting them, both, both personally and professionally. Um, and so each week I like to remind you of the physician support line and this is uh, a, uh, a line that has been stood up by our psychiatric colleagues. There are over 600 psychiatrists who volunteer their time to staff this, this uh, phone line specifically for physicians who might need someone to talk to or often not very good at um, seeking out or taking the time to seek out care for ourselves. And, um, and yet, you know, we're the, the population of professionals with the highest suicide rate. And so um, that number is 888-409-0141. Um, and they have expanded their hours now. They're open from 8 in the morning to 3 a.m., seven days a week Eastern time. Um, they have so many psychiatrists that have volunteered to support this work that they've actually stopped taking volunteers because they've had so many. So um, it's, you know, it's one way that I think uh, the psychiatrists who, who may not feel like they have a big role in COVID response can help give back to the community of the people who are, are much more impacted. So um, we set up our incident command system here at Tennessee Department of Health on January 15th, and um, that is the structure that we put in place whenever uh, an outbreak is recognized in the state. Um, we've done it for measles and for hepatitis A, and, uh, and on January 15th, 114 days ago, we did it for COVID-19. Um, and uh, we first identified our first case 64 days ago um, one, uh, one thing that you may not know about how the response is done here is, you know, typically when there's an infectious disease outbreak in the state, it's the Tennessee Department of Health that runs that response through our incident command system. But in this particular case, since a, a state of emergency was declared in the state, when that happens, then by law, TEMA, uh, Tennessee Emergency, Medi uh, Emergency Management, uh, agency takes over that response, and so um, TDH falls in under that and helps to advise the unified command group that's been set up and works very closely with TEMA in um, our response to this, but the, the overall response um, is led by TEMA, uh, and we, we assist them as best we can. We continue to have a clinician call in line. If you have questions about patients who have coronavirus, um, you know, whether or not they should be tested, how to get testing, um, if you have questions about whether or not uh, patients should be tested, you're welcome to call that line. It's staffed by our, most of our epidemiologists here. Um, we have some nurses on that line, and then some of the TDH physicians are also on that line. <clears throat> that is uh, staffed from 8 in the morning to 6 o'clock Monday through Thursday. 8 to 4.30 on Fridays, 8 to 4 on Saturday and Sunday, those are all central time. And then there's always a TDH physician who's on call overnight, seven days a week for public health emergencies like rabies bites and carbon monoxide exposures and things like that um, if you need that assistance. As of yesterday, we had 14,096 cases in the state. That was up 158 from the day before. We generally had somewhere between two and 400 new cases a day, depending on the amount of testing that we're doing. Um, we've had 237 deaths, and you might notice that that says minus two deaths from yesterday, and that's not because uh, we now have the zombie apocalypse happening, but because um, when we report those, we sometimes find out later on that there's a change in that demographic. So in this case, one of those cases uh, was from out of state, so not a Tennessee resident, so um, it does not count in the Tennessee numbers and will be attributed to that state. Um, and the other was a probable case, and 
Uh, earlier this week, we began reporting probable cases. Um, some decisions have been made to no longer report probable cases. Uh, it certainly makes um, reporting more complicated to do that. So one of those deaths was a probable uh, COVID-19 death, and so that was removed from the death count. Um, We've done um, close, what's closing in on about a quarter of a million uh, tests across the state. Uh, 9,227 were processed just between Wednesday and Thursday. So um, Tennessee has very much ramped up their ability to um, process tests quickly, and we do that not only through the state public health labs, but also through our, um, our private partners. Um, some of those um, private laboratories that run and also hospitals uh, that have the ability to uh, test as well. And these are all um, PCR tests, the molecular tests that are actually detecting the virus. These numbers don't reflect any kind of antibody testing that's been done. Um, we still have two counties that are um, holding at zero cases. One is Hancock County, uh, which uh, has its population is 92nd out of 95 in the state. And then Pickett County, which is the smallest population in the state, um, both those counties have been doing testing, but um, they have not yet identified cases, which is nice. And they've actually um, been the, the sole survivors in this for several weeks now. This is what the epi curve looks like and those spikes that you see tend to demonstrate um, mass testing events that we've had. Uh, the, the largest of those have been in some of the prison systems across the state where, where they've had large numbers of asymptomatic cases within those populations. So that's what um, some of that spiking is. And you see sort of this rhythm of, of um, high, high bars that slowly go down over the course of the week, and that's just the, the cadence um, of how those tests are processed and collected across the state. Um, our hospitalization rate is about 9% as of right now, with about 38% of those cases still um, undergoing investigation to find out if they were hospitalized, but fairly low, which is good. Um, uh, I do want to draw your attention to the disparity that we're seeing with 40% of our cases being in white, 21% being in uh, black or African American, and that is um, an over-representation compared to their population within the state. Um, and while blacks have 21% of the cases, they have 31% of the deaths. So. Um, that I think points to some of the, the ongoing disparities that we see with access to health care, um, possibly access to testing. It may be that uh, there are more cases out there that are asymptomatic or mild cases, and we just don't know because those folks haven't been tested. Um, but uh, we're doing some concerted efforts to try to get testing into communities that may not have had great access to that so far. About 3.4% of our population has been tested. That, um, that does not exclude people who've been tested more than once. So that number is a little bit higher than, uh, than the, what's reflective of the actual population that's been tested. 6.1% of those tests have been positive, and that's come down from about 7.8% that we had early on uh, as the testing numbers have increased. And we've done testing in um, populations that are not only the symptomatic population, then we've seen um, that, that test number come down. And then we've held very steady at this 1.7% death rate, and, and it was 1.7% April 1st, uh, and it's still 1.7% now. Uh, what we have seen climbing is the percent of deaths that are uh, encompassed by the 61-year-old plus age range and that's now up to 87% of the deaths in the state. Um, that has steadily increased from about 80% a month ago uh, and, and has continued to grow to be you know, the overwhelming uh, majority of folks that are in that 61 to uh, 80 plus uh, age range. We've had um, 304 cases in children 10 years and under, which, which is about 2%, and that's uh, pretty much online with what we're seeing nationally, about 2.2% 2, 2 .2 of children across the country um, have been positive for COVID-19, and then about 6% in the second decade of life 
Um, and many of those cases are, are in the later part of the second decade of life where they're really acting a little more like adults than they are acting like children. I wanted to go a little bit through uh, where things are with vaccine development right now um, and, and do an overview first of what the different phases of clinical trials mean. So we hear those numbers thrown around a lot, phase one, phase two um, clinical trials. So a phase one trial um, is primarily around safety. It's a small number of folks that get tested. And, and generally, phase, uh, phase one trials don't really benefit the individual who volunteers to participate in that trial. So they're, they're looking at safety. Um, in phase two, we get a few more people and they look at, at safety as well as dosing to try to determine what the safe uh, and effective dose might be. Um, in phase three, they're looking at primarily at safety and efficacy and then they begin to scale the population. And then that drug goes through FDA review and moves to phase four which is um, the post-approval surveillance uh, after the, the drug has been approved for use. So um, I just wanted to give you some updates on where some of the vaccines are that we've discussed in some of our previous webinars. So phase one, um, just looking at safety right now, there is a um, recombinant novel coronavirus vaccine that's in an adenovirus vector that is being um, studied in China in uh, some phase one, so small number trials there. Um, they have um, started to move towards their phase two trial. And then there is a, a University of Oxford vaccine that's been funded by the um, United Kingdom government. That's a chimpanzee adeno vaccine um, vector. Uh, and this is a, a group that had um, previously developed a vaccine for mirrors. Um, and so this is also still in a phase one trial um, that they've done. And, um, but they, they did say uh, that when they tested this in rhesus monkeys and then they exposed them to heavy quantities of virus, quote unquote, they were considered healthy 28 days later. So they've at least had some um, possibly encouraging news in a non-human model. Uh, and then there's a couple more in the phase one trial still, Inovio which we've talked about before is a DNA vaccine. And this is the one that um, is a little bit Star Trek-y sounding. This vaccine is injected intradermally um, into the host using a smart device. So they actually in inject the DNA and then the DNA is used to make the protein by the body and then the body makes antibodies to the protein. Uh, so they've been working on that one. There's a, a phase one and two trial in South Korea right now and um, they're looking to have some interim results maybe that at late next month. And then um, Pfizer and a company called BioNTech have um, worked together to develop four different mRNA-based vaccine candidates that are going through trials in the United States and Germany right now. Um, and uh, they just started those trials this week in the, in the United States. So four major players there. And then in phase two, there are two vaccines that have moved into phase two. One is Moderna, which has had a, a lot of press. Um, it is an mRNA vaccine, and we've not um, had mRNA vaccines in humans before. So um, this one is, is interesting. They have um, had some candidates before related to SARS and MERS as well. Um, but they had some encouraging news out of their phase one trials and, and have now just this week moved into phase two. Um, they have a pretty ambitious timeline to um, have their protocol for phase three trials uh, finalized and expected to start sometime this summer. And they're projecting that they may have limited quantities of vaccine available, um, perhaps to be distributed to healthcare workers who are at high risk by um, even late fall. So um, that's one to maybe keep an eye on. And then the second is one uh, out of Beijing, which is an inactiv inactivated COVID-19 vaccine, which is um, similar to the, the other vaccines that we're more accustomed to. And uh, they're in a phase one, two trial in uh, people over the age of five, so six and up and um, have reached phase two status just last week and so should be um, progressing through that over the course of the next few months. And then there's one um, 
vaccine that's in a phase two, three combined trial right now, looking at safety, dosing, and efficacy. And this one is out of uh, Melbourne and uh, the Netherlands. And it's looking at the BCG live attenuated vaccine as potentially uh, something that might stop COVID-19. Um, so that's also one that um, we should watch. Um, and I'll be interested to hear Dr. Schaffner's thoughts maybe about this one. Um, but there have been some um, non-peer-reviewed observational papers to suggest that, uh, that where there are um, children who've received BCG vaccine, that, that they've done better than uh, countries that don't receive BCG vaccine. Um, there's some new things coming out about antibody research. So there was a study that was that just came out from China that was reported by FDA uh, yesterday by Dr. Collins. A small study of 285 people who were hospitalized with severe COVID-19 disease. They found that 100% of those people developed IgM antibody within two to three weeks. Some of them developed IgG antibody, um, but the question still remains if that antibody will be protective or if it will be long-lasting. So um, again, we're still kind of waiting on uh, the idea of using antibody testing to make any determinations about individual behavior or protection against COVID-19. Um, we often get questions about sensitivity and specificity of some of the antibody tests. So FDA is now listing these for the antibody testing, which is great. Um, one of the assays, which is the Abbott Architect, which is one that uh, Department of Health here has acquired and is going to start um, using it as soon as they have this validated, shows a sensitivity of 100% for IgG and a specificity of 99.6%. Um, but these tests are kind of all over the place. I've shown another one from Chembio, which has a, an IgM sensitivity of 77.4% and an IgG of 87.1%. So um, they're all over the map. And, and again, um, we just don't know what the, the actual meaning of any of this is yet. So there's uh, people furiously trying to figure out what that is, but it's going to take some time to understand how long those antibodies are lasting and if they're protective. Um, and there's still no clear way of serologic test with an FDA emergency use authorization. So if anyone is um, peddling um, CLIA waived antibody tests to you, those, uh, those are not FDA EUA. Um, which doesn't mean that they're FDA approved. It just means that FDA has at least reviewed the test uh, and has given it some preliminary thumbs up as uh, a test that might be worthwhile. So those don't exist yet for CLIA wave labs. There, um, there was a story also out of Israel where they have um, isolated a monoclonal IgG antibody uh, against COVID-19, and so there's possibility that that could be developed into a therapy to assist people who have severe disease, and certainly um, that will assist in helping to um, be able to study the longevity of antibodies and, and whether or not um, they'll be beneficial. And then uh, there was a, an update from remdesivir uh, this week. So we talked about this before. This is an antiviral medication that um, has had some broad spectrum anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity. They've had a couple of trials that have come out that showed a reduction in hospitalized, hospitalization time and also a reduction in mortality. Um, and so it did this week receive an FDA emergency use authorization. Prior to that, it had been compassionate use only and in children and pregnant women. Um, but now it does have FDA EUA. So we might start seeing more of that. There's some um, good large number trials that are, um, that are going on. Um, you know, of course, the downside to this drug is that this is an IV medication, so it's not going to be a, a Tamiflu kind of um, treatment for COVID-19 like we might have with flu. It's going to be more for those folks who um, maybe are severe enough to be hospitalized. But, but there may be some hope here that this can reduce morbidity and mortality, especially for those at the highest risk. Um, so our current priorities as a state has, has uh, come down from the Unified Command Group, which is the governor and 
Commissioner Piercy, um, uh, Director McWhorter, uh, Director Sheehan from TEMA and others, is um, to start doing some population testing. So the last few weeks we've been doing drive-through testing, large-scale large drive-through testing events where there have been between five and 11,000 tests done in a weekend across the state for anyone who um, wanted to have a test. Uh, we're moving into, uh, for the month of May, uh, changing into some priority population testing. So the governor has asked that we um, test everyone who is uh, housed in a prison um, and in all of the long-term care facilities across the state. And then looking at certain vulnerable populations like those living in subsidized housing or homes for the aged or um, those in congregate care for intellectual disabilities. So all of those are being coordinated now and uh, you'll start seeing some numbers coming out of those um, probably as early as next week. We um, also continue to ramp up our contact tracing and there are several hundred folks that are being monitored right now as either being in isolation or quarantine um, and we have um, uh, amassed folks who can do that contact tracing for us across the state. We're in the process of uh, continuing to stand up an alternate care site, which is out in Memphis. Uh, it's about 75% complete at this point and will house somewhere around 400 plus patients uh, in, if there's a need that we um, have that capacity for overflow, say, this fall if we start to have um, some overwhelming number of sick individuals as flu comes back and we're still dealing with this. And then um, we continue to work very hard to procure supplies and, you know, we are competing with the entire world, not just for N95 masks and, and isolation gowns, but also for things like um, test kits and even nasopharyngeal swabs that are um, difficult to come by. So uh, we have a whole room full of people over at TEMA that do nothing but um, look at sources for these supplies and, and run down uh, a lot of times what ends up to be uh, shadow groups that don't really have things to give us, but um, they work very hard to find quality um, materials for us and also to work with local companies in the state of Tennessee that might be able to manufacture some of the things that we need uh, to help protect both our, our healthcare workers, uh, our laboratorians, and, uh, and also the general public. Um, as a reminder, all of the health departments in the state have the capacity to do, to do drive-through testing um, and they have varying hours of operation, but you can go to tn.gov and then click on the red banner at the top of the page and go down to the box that says get tested, it looks like the one shown on your screen. You can click on there and there's an interactive map that you can um, scroll over to select a county and a, a um, list of uh, locations and times will pop up so that you know where you can send folks to give uh, to get testing if you're not able to do it in your office yourself or if you um, have a, a friend or a loved one or someone in your community that would like to get tested, you can refer them to their local health department and, and they can arrange that for them. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out with some guidance just this week on planning considerations for return to inpatient uh, in-person education in schools um, and you know any federal guidance that comes down around reopening type things whether it's going to be return to sports or return to school or um, what you do with uh, a barber shop um, is, is going to have to be looked at through the lens of what's going on in that particular community so it's a whole lot easier to make an order to shut things down uh, than it is to try to open things back up so even with schools those decisions are going to be made on a district level. The Department of Education does not dictate whether or not uh, individual school districts operate. And uh, what those school districts are going to have to look at is their local disease burden and their community spread. Um, a, a county like Pickett that has had no cases identified and, and no um, indication right now that they have 
community is spread, it's a very rural county that's, that's got low population, um, what their return to school looks like may look very, very different than what it looks like in Nashville or Shelby County or even um, some of the, the suburbs of those metro areas where they've got a much larger disease burden. Um, you also need to consider the age of the children in school. We know from national numbers that it's, it's much less likely for young children to be infected and infectious with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So um, the, the numbers are looking at somewhere around 22 per 100,000 children in the United States that have been infected at this point. Um, so younger children may, uh, may be able to come to school and maybe it's the teachers that need to be masked and, and um, make sure that they're protecting themselves, but it, it might be safer for young children to go to school than it will be for high school students or college students to go to school. So um, that, that may look very different even within a county um, depending on the, the age of the kids that they're looking at. And then what's likely going to have to happen is this preparation to open and close individual um, institutions or schools as cases are identified. So if, uh, if a case is identified and it's, it's not possible to know who may have been in close contact with that individual, then that school may look at having to close down for two weeks uh, to sit through that quarantine period while the other schools in the district are still going on and, uh, and then reopen. And so those contingency plans around online learning and, and alternate uh, ways to educate children are going to be really important um, over the course of this coming year. Um, and then uh, I wanted to, again, share with you this link for uh, PPE requests. Um, so if you need PPE and have not had access to PPE, you can try uh, requesting it through TEMA at this link, uh, AR, arcg.is slash one capital L, little I, capital C, capital C, capital P and then a passcode 8362 at the end of the survey, you can request small quantities of PPE up to what you might burn through in a two-week period in your office. Um, enter your organization type as other uh, and then explain what you are, and they should um, ship that directly to you. So last week's survey, 83% uh, 80, of the respondents had received PPE within about six days. So um, if 10 days have gone by and you haven't received anything, you might resubmit that request. Um, but the, it looks like the vast majority of folks are getting what they request um, over the course of about a week. So it's worth a try. Um, so we'll ask you again, too, if you have used the Survey123 link to order PPE, um, let us know because we like to give TEMA that feedback. And then um, if you did use that link, how long did it take for you to get um, your PPE to you? So let us know those answers too. And so now I'm going to see if we can get Dr. Schaffner on the line to have some <laughs> conversation. Hi, Shelley. He's here. Hey, Bill. How are you? <laughs> Very fun. Thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. um, we're excited to have you on with us today and, uh, and to hear some of your thoughts about um, COVID-19 and what you're seeing at Vanderbilt. I know uh, we, we have our TVs up on in the shock uh, all day, every day, and, and most days I look around and see your face on some kind of national network. So um, we'd love for you to share some of what you've been sharing nationally with folks and, and then, uh, you know, your take on some of this. Well, I thought your presentation was wonderfully comprehensive. I learned some good stuff and took notes, so thank you very much for that. Uh, there are all kinds of issues that are up there. Lots of people are interested in how we're going to be able to return to what I call a new normal, and uh, that's important. There's some questions about uh, traveling. Uh, those kinds of issues have come up recently, so I'm, I'm happy to chat about anything that you would like. 
Sure. Um, so let's let's talk about what's coming out around inflammatory disease in pediatrics, if if you don't mind. So, you know, we've seen these reports of kids um, coming out of New York that have had ca uh, Kawasaki's like or atypical Kawasaki's like presentations. And for for those of you on the call who might not be pediatricians and familiar with Kawasaki's, it's a um, a illness that we see usually in young children, toddler age. Um, kids are fairly miserable. They have very high, long-lasting fevers. 105 for 10 days is, is not unusual. Um, swollen hands and feet. Um, they get these out-of-sight platelet counts in the millions. Um, they uh, and then long term they can end up with coronary artery aneurysms and it's long been thought that this is a virally mediated process. It's treated usually with IVIG, um, so pooled antibody that that calms that back down. And uh, and now we seem to be seeing that in some kids who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Yeah, it, it has a new moniker because people are trying to distinguish it from Kawasaki disease. It's called Pediatric Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome, and it involves inflammation in the skin, eyes, and blood vessels in the heart. These children present with fever, rash, reddish eyes, swollen lymph nodes, and often quite uh, severe abdominal pain. Uh, they have low PO2s, and they can get low blood pressure. Uh, and so uh, this is a very striking illness thought to be related to COVID can occur during and after the resolution of COVID. It's thought to be pretty unusual, but cases are now being reported not only in Europe, but here in the United States. And I think I saw a report recently that said in, in New York State, for the entire state, they've already recorded over 60 cases. So unusual, but I would say not rare. And as you said, Shelley, it's thought to be some variant of an inflammatory response induced by the virus or somehow involving our immune system. I'll tell you what it reminds me of a little bit, uh, having to do with influenza. There's information that's been gathered over the last 10 years to indicate that middle-aged and older adults, after they recover from the acute influenza illness, have a continuing inflammatory response that can involve blood vessels. Hmm, sounds similar to this. And people who recover from influenza in those middle-aged and older age groups have an increased risk of stroke and heart attacks for about a month. So the inflammatory response is still there, even though people have recovered from the acute illness. Not well understood, but starting to be described. And somehow this had kind of a, a memory of that came up as I read this. Yeah. Do you know if they're are are they seeing the the outrageously high platelet counts like they see in Kawasaki's? Do you know? Uh, I haven't seen that reported. And when you mentioned it, I said, hmm, I'm going to have to go back and look at those reports. They're not prominent, and I don't think people have fevers very very mm -hmm. high. I mean, they can have them, but not very high. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, I, this all of this kind of got my brain swirling because, um, you know, you, you hear about the adults that are having thrombotic events and having strokes, and you know, if if they go in and they're relatively healthy and don't need to be hospitalized, and they figure they've got COVID-19, they might not get blood work on those individuals. And then I started to think, well, you know, if this is a Kawasaki's kind of thing, then is the reason that they're having these thrombolic phenomenon being because they've got platelet counts in the millions and they're clotting things off. So yeah, I started I started to think down all those roads. Uh, um, understood. Yeah. Um, so another um, thing that I wanted to talk with you about is has what's Vanderbilt been doing or do you know around um, screening pre-op patients for COVID-19 mm -hmm. as a means of deciding whether or not they're going to have surgery. We've heard some 
hospitals that do an antibody test first, and if the antibody test is positive, then they move to PCR. Um, what's going on with, with uh, Vanderbilt, and what have you heard about the rationale for that? Well, I've, I've just checked in. We're not doing any antibody testing yet. We're working on developing our own antibody test. I'm impressed that the Abbott test is quite as, I, I had heard it was pretty good, but you provide some powerful data to indicate that it's really a solid test. Uh, but we're doing antigen testing, you know, mm -hmm. classical nasal swab uh, testing now on all patients with elective surgery and ladies who are coming in for L&D. Mm -hmm. And those are the populations that are now being targeted, and I think we're going to stay at that for a while simply because of our testing capacity, uh, which uh, continues to be stretched. And so I don't think we can manage anything much larger than that, in addition to the usual clinical uh, testing that we're doing. I know that there's some hospitals here and there around the country who've actually started to do um, antigen testing um, for all admissions, but we're not anywhere close to that yet. Yeah. Do you, um, do you what oh, are your oh, thoughts? I, 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 yeah, oh. let, 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 let me add one little thing. Yeah. We heard a preliminary report from Emory for L&D that knocked our socks off. They, we heard this, that 14% of patients coming to Emory in labor and delivery were positive. And we thought that that was an extraordinarily high percentage. We were really surprised at that. Yeah, I've heard numbers uh, along that line too, you know, one in five, one in six of uh, women who have come in to L&D. And so it's, um, I, I know at Vanderbilt, uh, when women are coming in positive, then they're having those infants room in with their mother, which is great because there's been some guidance that um, that came down that suggested mothers should be separated from their infants if if the mother was positive, um, which uh, you know seemed seemed unusual since you're then going to send that baby home with that mother. But um, but Vanderbilt I think has done a really nice job of of having uh, those moms and babies room in together and take some precautions with distancing and masking with breastfeeding, which has been nice, but at the same time, identifying those moms so they can try to reduce any kind of transmission that might go on in the unit there. Good. Um, we have a question here about, is, do you know if there's any evidence of a prophylactic dose of, of aspirin, like an 81 milligram, mm -hmm. um, useful in protecting middle age uh, and adolescents from the vascular complications like strokes? I have heard that discussed, and I will tell you, I was a little bit surprised. This is about a week ago. Tony Fauci was asked that question on national television on CNN one evening. And uh, he acknowledged the theory, made the point that nothing like that was being recommended nationally, but then he added the postscript, which was pretty frisky for Tony, namely that, well, he could understand people doing that and some folks might do that, kind of opening the door to that. But mm -hmm. I had not heard, I've not heard anyone else making any sort of formal recommendation along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard anything either, and of course, you know, in pediatrics, we worry about giving aspirin to children with acute viral conditions yes. because of the risk of Rye syndrome, right. Right. which causes liver failure, and um, and so, you know, we, we as pediatricians would certainly want to be cautious about um, parents deciding to do that without a recommendation. Um, let's, uh, let's answer some more of the questions that we have here. So. Um, there's someone who says, I own a pediatric outpatient rehab clinic. I would love some guidance on what our new normal should look like as far as allowing parents in the building, screening and wearing masks. Are these things we should plan to continue indefinitely? Oh, I think indefinitely is uh, probably quite appropriate. This is a new normal. Uh, I'm sure you've discussed in this, uh, in this setting whether the coronavirus is going to go away in the summer, which none of us think it will be. The human coronaviruses, the ones that cause common colds, are somewhat seasonal, 
but not as strikingly seasonal as is influenza, for example. So the human coronaviruses are more common during the winter in ca causing colds, but they smolder along in the summer. If, we, if we're lucky, this COVID-19 virus has read the textbook and knows what to do, but I'm not sure it has. And so we can't count on that. But even if it does abate, it's still going to be there. And we all anticipate that we're going to have a rise in COVID along with influenza in the late fall and winter again. So I think that this is the new normal. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's indefinitely for now. Uh, and, you know, we don't really have a, an end in sight of this until we get a vaccine or have a better understanding about antibodies. And, um, and you know, I think one of, the, one of the things I'll mention about antibody testing, too, while I'm, while I'm saying that, is, uh, you know, there's been some pretty strong guidance that's come out from um, you know, the Infectious Disease Societies, from FDA, uh, really recommending that antibody testing not be done outside of a clinical trial. Um, or for use for population type, um, you know, information surveillance type work, um, because we don't understand what those antibody tests are saying. And you know, the other thing I started to think about is as we start to, to see these, you know, atypical Kawasaki types presentations and things, are diseases like measles, where you can have someone who gets measles recovers from measles, develops antibody to measles, but then as studies have shown us over the last year, that post period of about three years or so where, where the measles virus has resulted in a wiping out of maybe 40% or so of, of the immunity that that individual has, increasing all-cause mortality for those patients over the next three years from other non-measles illnesses, and then maybe six, eight, ten years down the road, resulting in subsclerosing panencephalitis and ending up in, in sure death for a percentage of those children. And so, um, so I worry a little bit about the, the folks that I see. I even see a lot of physicians on um, platforms like Facebook that are talking about how they're recommending that their patients be antibody tested and the false sense of security that that might be giving people not only about reinfection with this, but also the ideas that some have touted about, you know, well, everyone should just go out and get exposed so that they develop antibody to the disease. <laughs> and Dr. Shafter just fell on the floor. Um, you know, so the, the, the folks out in Bakersfield, California, that, uh, that got some national attention and suggested that all the young people should go get uh, sick with, with SARS-CoV-2 too, so that they can help build herd immunity. So um, I, I want to know that I'm not off base in what I'm saying with that and, and maybe get some reinforcement from you. Well, you've got as much reinforcement as you can possibly get from me. <laughs> Absolutely, Shelley. This is, no, that's not a good thing. That's the modern equivalent of chickenpox parties. Uh, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, you know, we really don't know what this virus can do in children. It, I mean, one of the striking epidemiologic features of COVID-19 is that children are apparently spared largely, but not completely. And the next one infected, the next child infected could be your child or your grandson or the neighbor's child. I'm, uh, we, we have to be very, very careful about that. Let's wait for the vaccine, shall we? Uh, a safe and effective vaccine is, uh, as I like to say, the way out of this closed room that we're in at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, since vaccines are kind of my thing too, I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> looking forward to when that happens and we're planning for that, uh, when, when that happens and how we're going to get that out to the people that need it. Um, speaking of vaccines, so there, someone's wanting to know about um, worrying about a resurgence in vaccine preventable diseases because we've had kids that haven't gone to um, their doctor's offices. And last week I shared some data 
Um, so from, from in Tennessee, um, quarter one of 2020 compared to quarter one of 2019, we had already lost about 4% of our administered doses through the VFC program. And that's really with this uh, pandemic only affecting Tennessee for a couple of weeks of quarter one. So we're in the process of pulling March to March and then April to April um, to look at this year versus last year. Uh, New York City has reported a 76% drop in the amount of vaccine that's been ordered by their physicians, which is terrifying, um, especially you know, in New York City where we struggled with measles so horribly last year um, in some populations. And then uh, I was just on an email thread this morning with St. Jude that um, talked about how the diagnosis of cancer in children has dropped by 40 to 50% over the last few months in the United States, which isn't because we have some miraculous cure for cancer, but because kids aren't getting diagnosed because their parents are afraid to bring them into the doctor, and when they do show up, they're showing up in late-stage disease. Uh, so those are, are all things, you know, as a pediatrician that, um, that just rip at my heart. Um, and, uh, you know, it's so important that, that our doctors and our families get the message that we've got to be um, getting children into their doctor's offices and continuing with their care and doing that as safely as we can. Boy, uh, you've just given me some sobering information from that email uh, chain that you've had with St. Jude's about children not being uh, diagnosed promptly with their various cancers for the reasons that you talked about. That's, oh, that's sobering. Uh, but as, as, as you well know, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians are very concerned about, uh, about immunizing children and trying to get people to arrange for their immunization in their practices in a, as safe a, a way as possible. It's hard to immunize a child via telemedicine. <laughs> and there are suggestions uh, all the way from trying to see healthy children uh, for their routine immunizations early and saving uh, the sicker kids for later in the day in the practice and other suggestions like that. But this is clearly a fallout from COVID-19 that is becoming progressively more concerning. Yeah. So what, so what about the flip side of that? So what about elderly patients that aren't going into doctor's offices? Do you have more concerns about that population going into an office, or, or do you feel like it's the same response, that they, they just have to um, find the safest way and, and try to go on as they normally would? So there's a lot of illness management, right, in older patients. And as I talk to the internists uh, at Vanderbilt, they're doing a pretty good job with that. But you can't take an EKG via telemedicine. And there are other things such as getting routine blood work and stuff like that, which can be postponed for a while, but then Patients are going to have to be encouraged to come in very, very briefly, wearing their mask, good hand hygiene, get the blood drawn, and et cetera, get the EKG or whatever is necessary to follow the patients. We are looking forward to a crunch when it comes to flu shots this fall. And we're concerned that if people are still not going to their doctor's offices where they can get immunized, and this may be an opportunity for pharmacists to play an even larger role because at the in and out to the pharmacy is usually much quicker than to a doctor's office, unless you're in a rural area, and the parking is immediate and convenient. And, uh, and so there are opportunities there uh, to expand, and we're worried already that COVID is going to impede the acceptance of influenza vaccine, which although good is not great, many people, as you know, don't take advantage of influenza immunization each fall. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, you think about how many cases of, 
of influenza we could still prevent and how many deaths we could prevent if, if folks would get uh, vaccinated every year. Um, what about other um, adult management, uh, specifically of COVID-19, are, are you hearing? Um, you know, hydrochlorothiazide, or not hydrochloroquine. <laughs> yeah. um, I've, done that. I've done that. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to do. Um, keeps popping up, um, and I, I know there have been some um, studies, you know, to, to really suggest that, that hydrochloroquine might make things worse than better, um, but yeah, I think there's still studies going on and, and even prophylactic studies for healthcare workers. Do you know much about that? Well, there is a large multi-site study, over 50 sites uh, across the country, NIH sponsored, as it happens. Our colleague Wes Self here at Vanderbilt is the principal investigator uh, looking at uh, hydrochloroquine. And uh, apparently patients are being uh, recruited into that trial across the country. So we hope we have some definitive answers in, in a couple of three months. Uh, remdesivir is, is out there and is available now under emergency youth use authorization in a number of medical centers around the country and have heard just yesterday uh, that we have some available uh, at Vanderbilt and there are a series of guidelines and strictures that have to be met before the patient can receive it. And um, have you heard anything about the more, um, you know, we, I, I, get in, I get in arguments on, uh, on social media that I shouldn't get into um, when folks uh, tout vitamin D and zinc and, and other types of vitamin things, which, you know, are all well and good, but, um, you know, often don't actually treat the condition. The, has there been anything in research that's come out about any of those types of therapies? I have not seen any of those kinds of naturopathic, more natural uh, therapies uh, being studied in a careful, rigorous fashion. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I always quote the aunt of one of my mentors, he used to quote her, who used to say, very interesting, if true. <laughs> Um, I uh, I like that a lot. Um, and oh, and I wanted to clarify. So the the trial that you were referring to, that they were recruiting into for hydrochloroquine, is that a prophylaxis trial or a treatment trial? That's a treatment trial, as far as I know. Okay. okay. Um, and then, uh, so this will be the last question, I think, because we're we are just about at time. Um, they want to know if I can ask you if you know of any adverse effects from mRNA or DNA vaccines, like the ones that we mentioned were in clinical trials right now. Um, I, I don't. And uh, <laughs> that said, we we know that every vaccine has some, but I haven't seen any data. Uh, and none that I can remember from past studies from years ago. So uh, sorry about that. More information down the line. Down the line. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're extraordinarily busy and in very high demand, but uh, the, I know the couple of hundred Tennessee folks that are on here um, greatly appreciate the time that you spent with us and, and contributing to the conversation and wish you well. And uh, maybe we'll get you back on again, but maybe, maybe we won't have to do these webinars much longer <laughs> because this will all just disappear into the ether. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we can hope. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Shelly, it's been great being with you, and uh, I can do anything I can do to support the Tennessee Department of Health. You know, just ask. Thank you very much. Appreciate you very much. And uh, everyone, I will uh, wish you all a great day. Um, next week, I am going to take a day off. And so uh, Dr. Amelia Keaton, who is our, um, she's over our hospital acquired infections uh, group here, office here uh, at TDH will be um, hosting for me next week and she'll have some special guest of her choosing to come along with her and, uh, and I will be back with you in a couple of weeks. So y'all have a great week. Thanks. <laughs>